The fact that the DVD writer is the new weapon of mass destruction in the world is primarily for the fact that a $50 billion film can be reproduced at the cost of, let's say, 10 or 15 cents. There is a fantastic quote by Mark Getty, who is the, the owner of Getty Images, which is a huge corporate image database, and he's one of the largest intellectual proprietors in the world. He once said, intellectual property is the oil of the 21st century. It's a fantastic quote. You can condense it to one word, that is war. He declared war with that, saying, we will fight for this stuff, these completely hallucinatory rights to images, ideas, texts, thoughts, inventions, just as we're fighting now for access to natural resources. He declared war. Strange kind of war. Is it a good thing or a bad thing that it's becoming harder, maybe impossible, to encapsulate information in discrete units and sell them? The simplistic answer, the answer that you get from Hollywood and the recording industry, is it's a disaster. BitTorrent was written by some guy in his living room who was living off of credit cards and became explosively huge. <laughs> It started Pirate Bay in 2003. It started on a shared server in Mexico uh, where my colleague Gottfried worked. So, well, I wasn't involved from the very beginning, but well, they needed some place to ho host it, and well, that's, that's when I first came into the picture. Uh, back, back then, I, I didn't even know how BitTorrent worked. I had, had someone explain it for me, and okay, we'll do that. So, so I hooked them up with, uh, with WebSpace on my server, which was uh, then hosted in the basement of, of the place I worked. The system for sharing all kind of files, all kind of pictures, movies, uh, music, games, applications, everything. It developed so that uh, the internet connection of that company became so uh, highly utilized that we had to move it to Sweden. And then we just kept growing and growing. I think we have like five million pairs at any given time. We have today the ability to make copies and distribute copies inexpensively. If one copy leaks out on the internet, very rapidly it's available to everyone. The recording industry's been freaked out. The movie industry's been freaked out. The suits don't know how to think about this. The worldwide motion picture industry lost $18.2 billion to piracy in 2005. Internet piracy alone cost the industry $7.1 billion. The people running America's movie studios know that if they don't do something, and fast, they could be in the same boat as the record companies. But we were always ready for a, for a raid or some, of some kind. So we basically just, we had a some sort of knowledge to how we would should react. But I, I woke up and uh, I checked my email and I had an email saying the police will take down the site today and they're looking for it and uh, you know uh, they're questioning uh, people and everything and I was like what the fuck. I got a, got a phone call from, from someone someone at my well, at the company that we shared office space with that uh, there was a there was a lot of a lot of poli policemen there. And I asked what the fuck so I was like, okay. So so I went there with a the cab, and the police actually stopped the cab with lights flashing and all. They wanted to know who I was, and I kept asking, who are you? And they, who are you? Because they didn't identify themselves as police officers. And after a bit of uh, who are you in, uh, they finally, yeah, we're police officers, we're here on an investigation. Åklagaren driver den här frågan som att det är frågan om förberedelse och medhjälp till upphovsrättsbrott. Hur ställer du dig i den frågan? Att han har helt fel. Är vi skyldiga så är Google skyldiga. Okej, okay, så man ska jämföra Google med The Pirate Bay? Absolut. Vad är skillnaden då? Ja, på Pirate Bay så kan man ladda upp torrentviler. Men å andra sidan på Google så kan man ju lägga till sajter med upphovsskyddat material som ska indexeras. Jag tror fortfarande att vi har gjort något olagligt. Vi har haft juridiska nissar som har kollat på det här och de tycker inte att torrentviler är olagliga. 
Men samtidigt sitter ni på en annan via sidor på Power Bay och Kona Microsoft. För att de tror att amerikanska lagar gäller i Sverige. Men det de egentligen i grund och botten påtalar är att det finns upphovsrättsskyddat material på sajten. Ja. Och det är ingen övervarsning för Nej. Så ni är inte omedvetna om att det finns upphovsrättsskyddat material? Ni bara väljer att vara passiva och inte ta bort? Det finns länkar till upphovsrättsskyddat material. Precis. Det finns länkar till upphovsrättsskyddat material. Ja. Det är ni medvetna om? Absolut. Actually, I just uh, checked if the site was still rolling, if it was just a joke or something. Uh, and the site was still up, so I thought maybe it's not a joke, so I'll just, you know, do whatever a respectable person would do and take uh, a copy out of all of the things on the site. And I remember actually taking a screenshot when uh, downloading the last pieces of, uh, of data, the last torrent files, and uh, all of a sudden it said like, 95% done and said connection reset by peer. It wasn't one of my peers, it was the police. All servers from all our server rooms were taken. In total, somewhere around 250-300 servers. Where the Pirate Bay is about 20 of those servers. Amsterdam Information Exchange, AM6, uh, reported that 35% of all the European internet traffic uh, just vanished in a couple of hours. Jackie and I are on a mission to stop piracy. If this were a movie, we could be on the bad guys ourselves. But this is the real world. We need your help. When you buy pirate movie and music, you support criminals. Now these criminals are counterfeiting other things, like electronics and medicine. Take action! Demand the real thing. Help us stop piracy. Let's terminate it. They put a lot of money into making those movies, making that music, so they want to get something back. But the way they're trying to stop the copying now, it's definitely not working. What's really at stake for the movie industry with all this piracy? Well, I think, you know, ultimately our absolute future. So Peter Chernin runs 20th Century Fox, one of the biggest studios in Hollywood. Somebody can put a perfect digital copy up on the internet, perfect digital copy, right? And with the click of a mouse, send out a million copies all over the world in an instant. And it's all free. If that takes hold, what kiss Hollywood goodbye. Chernin recently organized a summit between... It's one of the great ironies that our enemy in this is our consumer, and one of the rules that anybody in marketing knows is not make an enemy of your customer. Uh, we have no choice, because that, frankly, when the music is being consumed for free, they're no longer customers that we can look after. Ever since Napster, the music industry has been trying to kill file sharing. Right? You know, Napster was this huge global party of, you know, everybody suddenly had access to the largest music library in the world. And what they do? Well, they went after Napster and they shut it down. If you buy bootleg videos or download illegal copies from the internet, how are the people who bring you the movies supposed to pay for my glasses, get health insurance, and pay off my student loans? Because the movies we love are the work of hundreds of people. Not just the actors you see on screen. Or directors. But cameramen. Script supervisors. Fire safety officers. Costumers. And countless others. Yeah! With your support, we'll all keep, keep on working. If you're talking about the distribution of cultural material, of, of music and, and cinema, well, there is a long history of whatever the incumbent industry happens to be resisting whatever new technology provides. The sound engineer is ready. The musicians are set. And I see a record made. The first MP3 player uh, by Diamond Rio, sort of the initial company long before the iPod, they were met with a lawsuit. The sheet music people resisted the re recordings. Cable television in the 70s was viewed really as a pirate medium. All the television networks felt that taking their content and putting it on cables that ran to people's houses was piracy, pure and simple. The uh, video recorder was very strongly resisted by Hollywood. There were lawsuits immediately brought by the movie studios who felt, in fact, who said publicly that the VCR was to the American movie industry what the Boston Strangler was to a woman alone. The engineer mixes the sound to achieve the best musical balance in the record.
Traditionally, copyright infringement has just been a civil matter. If a copyright owner catches you doing something wrong, they can sue you and force you to pay them money. Criminal infringement liability, the ability to prosecute you and throw you in jail, has been reserved for circumstances of commercial piracy. Circumstances where you know someone has made 500 copies, is selling them on the street as a competition for the, for the real thing. Now the genius of artist and engineer, the work of many hands have brought the record to its destination. From its tiny grooves, the recorded vibrations of sound will be picked up by the dual point amplified electrically, and the beautiful blue Danube fulfills its mission in an ideal combination for the home. Well, in recent years, copyright owners have not been satisfied with that. They have wanted to reach out and be, uh, have criminal uh, recourse against people who are engaged in non-commercial activities. <laughs> We recognize and we know that we will never stop piracy, never. We just have to try to make it as difficult and as uh, tedious as possible, and we have to let people know there are consequences if they're caught. People. Uh, it's really as though they decided to intimidate the village, they would just chop off the heads of a few villagers, mount those heads on pikes as a warning to everyone else. Rapport kan ikväll avslöja att Rassian är ett resultat av ett politiskt spel på högsta politiska nivå mellan regeringarna i Rosenbad och Vita huset. Så här har det gått till. De mäktiga filmintressena i Hollywood har skickat sin intresseorganisation MPAA till Vita huset i Washington. Amerikanska utrikesdepartementet har sedan tagit kontakt med UD i Sverige och krävt att problemet med Pirate Bay måste lösas. Före påsk, för en och en halv månad sedan, åkte en delegation med företrädare för Rikspolisstyrelsen, Rikskriminalpolisen och Justitiedepartementet över till USA för att höra vad USA krävde. Amerikanska myndigheter lät då den svenska delegationen förstå hur problemet med Pirate Bay borde lösas. När delegationen var hemma igen hamnade frågan på högsta politiska nivå hos justitieminister Thomas Bodström som signalerade att något måste... Uh, there was mentioned a threat of WTO sanctions against Sweden. And in the first hand maybe you about US putting Sweden on the, this, this thing called the priority watch list. Efter statssekreterare Dan Eliasson uppgifterna om att Sverige utsatts för hot om handelssanktioner. Jag vet att det har förekommit diskussioner om eh, att eh, om internationella regelverket när det gäller handel och upphovsrätt inte följs av Sverige och andra länder, då finns det en sanktionsmekanism. Tycker du att det ingår i dina arbetsuppgifter att, rap att rapportera till en lobbyist från Hollywood? Jag rapporterar inte till någon lobbyist. Så det har really got to a high level. The minister of justice were accused uh, of committing crimes. Uh, in the raid yeah, because it's illegal for a minister in Sweden to tell the police exactly what they should do. Här bekräftas också att USA pressat på. Brevet skickades av John Malcolm på Hollywoods mäktiga lobbyorganisation MPA. Han påminner om deras möte i höstas. Vi diskuterade ingående organisationen Pirate Bay verksam i Sverige. Som ni säkert vet har den amerikanska ambassaden enträget bett Sveriges regering att agera mot Pirate Bay. Jag vill återigen uppmana er att utöva ett inflytande för att få de rättsvårdande myndigheterna i Sverige att vidta nödvändiga åtgärder mot Pirate Bay. They think that uh, the US jurisdiction stretches around the world that yeah it's illegal according to US law but it's not illegal according to Swedish law and the US is really appreciated that we yeah talk back to them tell them that you don't decide over the internet we the users do directly after the raid the MPAA sent out a press release saying basically um, mission succeeded and uh, that also shows very clear i think that the mission was not convicting people it was sabotaging Nobody thought we were actually going back online and that was like the biggest question, are you actually coming back online? 
and I was very clear that we are coming back online if you stop calling me. <laughs> the obvious goal of the goal of the police was to uh, get the Pirate Bay offline and get the, the internet supplier PRQ offline, but they failed miserably. After three days, the servers were back up and uh, most of the backups restored. So the uh, site worked perfectly. And uh, about a week after that, everything was back up 100%. Spectacular success for us. <laughs> Um, the effect of the raid was basically that we got a lot of free PR and the BitTorrent community got a lot of free PR. The days after the raid we had uh, doubled our visitor numbers and also it uh, awakened the debate about file sharing in Sweden. A lot of different youth groups to the parties were active in our demonstration to show the support for the file sharing in Sweden. I think we had four different parties attending uh, the demonstration and also three of them were speaking on behalf of their party at the demonstration uh, along with representatives of the Piracy Bureau and the Pirate Bay and also the newly formed Pirate Party. They doubled their members in two days. I have gotten a lot of support from the rest of the ISP community and a lot of new customers calling us up and saying hey we heard about the raid, we want to help you, we want to move our cool location to your place because they know that we stand for freedom of speech and we would like to defend it. Opinionsundersökningen visar att en majoritet av dem tycker att den här lagen mot fildelning är dum. De betraktar det som en allemansrätt ungefär som vi äldre säger på lingonplockning och svampplockning på annans mark. It was quite an eye opener for them that there is such, such a large base of popular support for, for file sharing and the general copyright issues. Now the site is virtually impossible to take down because we have implemented the redundancy everywhere. So if something goes down now, like for instance a new raid or something, we're going to be back up in a couple of hours instead of a couple of days. I've never bought a piece of music in my life. We don't think it's illegal because everyone's doing it. We can't really be blamed for just downloading something that's already on the internet. The new generation is just copying stuff out of the internet. It's the way they were brought up. They started with Napster or whatever. Music is free to them. They don't consider music being something you pay for. They, they pay for clothes, they pay for stuff they can touch. Intellectual properties, what the fuck is that? Well, people think it's legal because it's like copying like, without the copyright. If it's a crime, why put it on there? You can sue people forever. You can sue a handful of college students, university students in the United States. You can sue the investors of Napster. In, in Napster. You can sue the company that, that provided the software for Kazaa, but it doesn't shut anything down. Kazaa lost a big case in the United States in, Supreme Court, in the Supreme Court, um, uh, Kazaa and Grokster and a, a set of other companies. So those companies no longer operate. But the network still works. The conflict is fought with the words of diplomats, with gestures of friendship and help to uncommitted countries, even with cultural demonstrations. It is fought indeed on every level of man's experience, for the stakes are high. As one of the adversaries in the conflict, we see a challenge as great as any in our historic past, a challenge not we hope to be met and joined in battle but to be faced and fought in the hearts and hopes of men. It is the challenge of ideas. The ARPA network 
provides a new research opportunity for experimenting with issues in computer-to-computer -computer communication. We wanted to build a digital communication system which would stand in its own right as a better, more economical, a higher performance, uh, and faster and more reliable digital communication system. We didn't build in the 1970s networks of hierarchs. The computers that existed in the world were all multi-million dollar machines and they basically interrelated to one another in very equal ways. Here is an instance of the ARPANET as it was recently configured, as you can see with some 25 or 30 sites in it. The transmission of a message, say, from a node over here to a node over here might go as follows. The computer at this point would send a message into its local amp, which would break it down into thousand bit packets. The packets would then be transmitted from imp to imp along a route selected by the imps themselves. At the destination imp, the packets would be reassembled in the proper order and delivered to the computer. And then a message would go back along perhaps a different route to indicate that the original message was received. The whole transmission cycle typically takes no more than a few tenths of a second. The system is completely independent of the ups and downs of small numbers of lines. For example, if this circuit over here broke in the midst of the transmission, the message had gotten that far, it might then backtrack or back here and possibly take some other route until it gets to the destination. One of the really important characteristics of the internet is that it's extremely decentralized and that the services on the internet are invented and operated by other network users. You know, the network is built so that there's nobody in charge, that everybody has control over their own communications. Now, such a network would then operate with this computer talking to this computer by first sending a message to its imp, having this imp relay it to this imp, and this imp relay it to this imp, and then this imp deliver it to the final destination. It's an inherent function of the networks that we use today that this data is stored and copied and stored and copied. Normally transient, normally very fast, um, you know, in milliseconds, microseconds, uh, you know, uh, specialized pieces of equipment such as switches, routers, hubs, um, etc., do this all in the blink of an eye. But it's the way networks work. It's been hard to uh, share information for years. The printing press, of course, was the great step into sharing information, but the printing press didn't essentially handle the problem of distributing it. It handled the problem of copying it. And we have been needing for a long time some better way to distribute information than to carry it about. The print on paper form is uh, embarrassing because in order to distribute it, you've got to move the paper around. And lots of paper gets to be bulky and heavy and expensive to move about. And this is obviously going to make a tremendous difference in how we plan, organize, and execute almost everything of any intellectual consequence. So this entire area is bristling with information transfer of one type or another. For instance, the local council, Tower Hamlets and Hackney, we're sort of on the border here, um, have some of the uh, surveillance traffic and um, security cameras linked via wireless networks themselves. So the spectrum environment is getting very dirty or noisy. Every single packet that flies through the multitude of wireless networks and through the internet is listened for, stored in memory, and retransmitted, i.e. it's copied from one um, what's called network segment to the next. You know, our media environment now, our media um, 
ecosphere now is so broad, so large, that you cannot contain information very e easily anymore. You cannot stop or censor information or stop the transmission once it's out there. It's like water through your hands. It's, it's like trying to stop a dam from bursting. Whether you're using a sort of, you know, long-lost peer-to-peer system like the original Napster or, or you're using Nutella or you're using BitTorrent, uh, the, the principle here is that you are actually engaging in internet communication as it was originally designed. You are able to serve content as well as consume. Especially after the Napster lawsuit, we saw an emergence of a lot of more decentralized file sharing services. Computer programs that people could run on their own computers that would make them part of the network. Short of redesigning and re-engineering either the internet or the, the devices we use to interact with the internet, there's nothing that Hollywood or Washington or Brussels or Geneva can do anything about. They shattered Napster into millions of little pieces spread across computers all around the globe. And now if you want to shut it down, you have to track down every single one of them and turn it off. And they just can't do that. You know, They send out letters every month trying to shut down a couple here and there, but it just doesn't work. You know, There are just too many. It's, it's out of the bag now. Once it's that far distributed, it's really going to be hopeless. The music industry, if they want to stop file sharing, there's no central computer for them to go to and shut it down. They have to go all the way to the ends of every wire. They have to snip all the cords across the globe. The files have been shared. There's no way back. You can't, you, it's not about shutting down BitTorrent. It would be about confiscating everyone's hard drives. The files are out there. They have been downloaded. They're down. There's no up anymore. They're all down. You know, there's nobody you can go to and say, shut down the file sharing. The internet's just not built that way. The Matrix is a system, Neo. That system is our enemy. But when you're inside, you look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system, that they will fight to protect it. Were you listening to me, Neo? Or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? I was... Look again. Freeze it. If you are not one of us, you are one of them. What are they? They are guarding all the doors, they are holding all the keys, but they will never be as strong or as fast as you can be. So I think a lot of people like to see the contemporary you know, and the digital era as some kind of a unique break. And I think the important point to make here is not to see it as a unique break, but really to see it as a moment which accelerates things that have already happened in the past. For thousands of years, the scribal culture really handpicked the people who were given this code to transmit knowledge across time and space. It's an economy of scarcity uh, that you're dealing with. People are starved, in a sense, for more books. There are images from the 16th century of books that were chained and had to be guarded by armed guards outside a heavy, heavy door because it is very, very dangerous for people to have access to, to, to that. Printing becomes associated with rebellion and uh, emancipation. All of the emerging nation states of, of Europe uh, made it very clear that they would control information flows to the best of their ability. The printers were the ones who were hunted down uh, if they printed the forbidden text. So uh, more than, than the, we think of persecuting the authors, but it was really the printers who, who suffered most. The basic idea of censorship in 18th century France is the concept of privilege or private law. A publisher gets the right to publish a particular text that is denied to others. So he has that privilege. So 
essentially what you have is a centralized administration for controlling the book trade using censorship and also using the monopoly of the established publishers. They made sure that the books that flowed throughout a society were authorized, were the authorized editions, but also um, were um, within the control of the state, within the control of the king or the prince. You had uh, a very elaborate system of censorship, but in addition to that, you had a monopoly of production in a booksellers guild in Paris. It had police powers. And then the police itself had specialized inspectors of the book trade. So you put all of that together, and uh, the state was very powerful in its attempt to control the printed word. What is clear is that during the 18th century, the printed word as a force is just expanding everywhere. You've got publishing houses, printing presses that surround France in what I call a fertile crescent. Uh, dozens and dozens of them producing books which are smuggled across the French borders, distributed everywhere in the kingdom by an underground system. I have a case of one Dutch printer who p looked at the index of prohibited books and used it uh, for his publication program because he knew these were titles that would sell well. The pirates had agents in Paris and everywhere else who were sending them sheets of new books which they think will sell well. The pirates are systematically doing, I use the word, it's an anachronism, market research. Uh, they uh, do it, I, I've seen it in, in hundreds and literally thousands of letters. They are sounding the market. They want to know what demand is. And so the reaction on the part of the publishers at the center is, of course, extremely hostile. And uh, I've read a lot of their letters. They're full of expressions like buccaneer and private and uh, you know, people without shame or morality, etc. In actual fact, many of these pirates were good bourgeois in Lausanne or Geneva or Amsterdam, and they thought that they were just doing business after all. There was no international copyright law, and they were satisfying demand. There were printers that were almost holes in the wall or down in the... If they were printing uh, uh, subversive material, they could sort of hide their presses very quickly. People used to put them on rafts and float down to another town if they were in trouble with the authorities. It was very movable. In fact, you've got two systems at war with one another, and it's the system of production outside France that is crucial for the Enlightenment. Not only did this new media system spread the Enlightenment, but I won't use the word prepared the way for the revolution. It so um, indicted the old regime that this, this power, public opinion, became crucial in the collapse of the government in 1787-1788. This is epic. This one is crazy. Pirate Bay captain speaks out on TV for the first time. Yes. 2,000. 2,232 people got the story submitted by Costanel. Yeah. Pirate Bay. Pirate Bay. Pirate Bay. Pirate Bay. Although I will say, after watching this thing, they are totally screwed. <laughs> Clinton, do you have the video for the, the Pirate Bay or no? Goxford's smart Tom brainchild is the scourge of the film and music industries. He says he's part of a battle against greedy corporate America. He rarely does TV interviews, but now Gottfried and his three alleged accomplices are facing charges and could go to prison for conspiring to break copyright law. This guy's sitting there and he's just like, well, uh, yeah, we don't consider it illegal because you're not actually kind of participating. It's more of a hosting thing. And we're just like, he's fine. He's screwed. So, um... Tell us, what is your lawyer telling you about the, uh, about the trial and stuff? Yeah, he's really wondering where the prosecutor thinks there's a case in all this. And he also thinks that the material is uh, excessively huge 
for what he's trying to do. Could you show us the, uh, the 4,000 pages of documentation? What's left of it I can show you? Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's this, this three. It's a read. They paid some private detectives, to, uh, the MPI aided, and wanted them to find the Pirate Bay people and the servers. Um, then they followed Gottfried and Frederick around for some weeks, which must be amongst the most boring things you could do. Can we see the, is there a report for that someplace? Yeah. Like, yeah, we tried to find them, they're probably located there. And then they did like a trace route to find the IPs. Really high tech. And it's called Operation The Pirate Bay One. But basically, they say that we have willingly and uh, knowingly and uh, actually encouraged people to break the copyright law. And these are all the plaintiffs? These are people? Yeah, this is all of them. There, there's 31 different um, works. Or files. Could you go through some of the people who are behind this? Uh, it's the MPAA, it's uh, IFP, and it's uh, Anti Piracy Agency of Sweden. Okay, so these are just the names of the people who own the works? Yeah, and it says like the movie Pink Panther, uh, Prison Break Season 1, um, Siriana, whatever that is. It's a movie by Warner Brothers. George Clooney's film. Ah, I've never seen it, never heard of it, so. But I, I apparently help with it willingly and knowingly. You know, I've spread this file, I've spreading this file, and I've never even heard about the movie. Walk the Line, I actually have that on DVD somewhere. You know, 20 month investigation, and then he comes up with charges that are like not even copyright infringement, it's accessory to copyright infringement and preparation for copyright infringement. It's like, dude, fucking run. Seriously, yeah. run. Like, don't do TV interviews. Like, no. get the fuck yes. out is what, what you need are you to doing? be doing. Yes. Well, um, there's only one lawyer that actually thinks that we could get prison. And, like, no other lawyer in, in the whole world thinks that we could get prison time for this. And that's the MPA lawyer that says we're going to prison. And since she says that, she proves that either she's a really bad lawyer or that she's lying. What's her name? Uh, Monique Wadstedt. She's the, also the lawyer for the Scientology Church, um, funnily enough. If they can't uh, like make the charges stick on the biggest torrent site in the world, then no other torrent site would ever have anything to fear in Sweden. So I think we, we would make it a safe haven for torrent sites. Like Everybody would move here to be avoid uh, prosecution. Yeah, and, and would, you, would you be assisted with that? Definitely. You can contact me at tiamo at tfr.org for sales. <laughs> In, uh, what is it, 15 days, two weeks, the, <clears throat> the Hollywood companies need to come with their claims how much losses we have made them. But I mailed the MPAA and the RIA, RIA and uh, asked them, about, yeah, if you're losing this much money because of us, so how about you just buy us for, let's say, one-tenth of what you say you lose. Then you will go plus 90% that year in the losses. So, and, they would, and they never actually replied. We're surrounded by images every day, everywhere. There's nothing you can do about it. But the problem with these images is that they're not yours. People's lives are determined by images that they have no rights to whatsoever. And that's, uh, let's say it's a very unfortunate situation. There's this work of mine that people have described as a series of unattainable women. In fact, it's a series of unattainable images. The one last mission of cinema is to make sure that images are not seen. That's why we have DRM, copy protection, rights management, uh, region coding, all that stuff. But if an image is seen, then it tells you one thing. It's not your image. It's their image. It's none of your business. Don't copy it, don't modify it, just forget about it. You can't just say, hey, it's just the movies. It is reality. It's a very specific reality of properties. Radio, television, newspapers, film. At the heart of all of them, there is a very clear distinction between the producer and the consumer. And the idea is a very, very static one. 
that here is a technology that allows me to communicate to you, but it's not really a conversation that one has in mind. Here we return to the subject of ideological penetration. For if all other forms of penetration don't work, if the united strength of the non-communist world makes political penetration unfeasible and economic penetration unsuccessful, if cultural penetration does not do the job, the communists can always hope to succeed by resorting to ideological warfare against their strongest opponent, meaning us. It used to be if you had a radio station or television station or a printing press, you could broadcast your views to a very large number of people at quite a bit of expense, and a fairly small percentage of the population was able to do that. The materials were produced by some set of professional commercial producers who then controlled the experience and located individuals at the passive receiving end of the cultural conversation. I'm John Wayne. We believe in many things, but I'm John Wayne. If you wanted to change the way the television broadcast network works, good luck. You're going to have to get the majority of the shareholders to agree with you, or you're going to have to uh, replace some very expensive equipment. The number of people who could actively speak was relatively small, and they were organized around one of the only two models we had in the industrial period to collect enough physical capital necessary to communicate, either the state or the market usually based on advertising. The control that used to reside in the very making of the artifacts is up for grabs. Those whose permission was required are resisting this transition because control is a good thing to get if you can get it. Music didn't begin with a phonograph and it won't end with the peer-to-peer -peer network. At the most, I'm older, I take that either I can play with that. I rule that just. Well, Chipmunk, circular, fuck it, ice king, it will be SEP. We up hey, we up suits all day long, it's nothing. We up just, we up gnats, everyone. Alright, listen. And I couldn't give a shit if you're older. This young one's way older. In 10 years, then I'ma be known as a veteran older. I swear down for staying colder. The panic of the media industry and the music industry is that people could actually start to produce and that file sharing networks, file sharing technology enables them to produce. People have lamented much the death of the author. What we're witnessing now is far beyond. It's the becoming producer of former consumers. And that suggests a new economic model for society. It is not so much the fact that the Phantom Menace is downloaded 500 times or 600 times, etc. Yeah, of course, there is you know, an imaginary specter of economic loss that informs that. But the real battle or the real threat lies in a shift in the ways that we think of the possibilities of ourselves as creators and not merely as consumers, as writers, filmmakers, photographers, etc. It's like a whole network. This is a song that I've given out over MySpace and I, I've let people download it and um, they can download it, do what they want. I've made a blog about it saying, oh look, DJs, you can, you can play this where you want. Like, there's this guy in Brooklyn and he's just done a remix of it, just like, it's totally different to, to what I thought, but he's 
enthusiast, this, um, this guy from Brooklyn, and I really respect that in him, that he came back to me and he said, look, and it's going on his mix album. One of the things that intrigues me tremendously about the proliferation of material that's out there in the world for people to grab is the potential creation of millions of new authors. Thanks to the internet, thanks to digital technologies, the gatekeepers have really been removed. People can take more of their cultural environment, make it their own, use it as found materials to put together their own expressions, do their own research, create their own communications, create their own communities when they need collaboration with others. Rather than relying on a limited set of existing institutions or on a set of materials that they're not allowed to use, without going and, ask, and asking, please, may I use this? Please, may I create? In terms of samples, not, not many people go out of their way to clear samples. All right, then, right about now, like, I've got the things on the fruity slicer. Like, it's on different keys, so it's just different parts of the sample. Like, it's just some Turkish tune. I don't even know who's by. Like, it's just some random sample. <laughs> So really, I've made a tool for them to, to, to sort of MC2 anyway. I think that's good. It's good that people are ruthless enough to use another person's tune and record, record themselves like, like spitting bars over it. But sometimes you get the big artists freestyle on your stuff and you just sort of put it out there on their CDs and you don't even know about it. Kids, if they sample my music for to make them rock and roll music, that would be another good thing as well. I would like that as well. I want them to do that later. If I made an old tune, take a bit from it, drop up something over it and, and make it music, make it big. If you can do that, do that. When you put primary materials in the hands of ordinary citizens, really, really interesting things can happen. I ain't no musician. Like, I just know how to like, make things sound good. Uh, I want to make people realize their own value. I want them to realize that they are the masters of their own content, that they are, they create something, they can share it. If someone else created something, they can contribute, they can help, they can get it uh, and use it the way it's supposed to be. So it's a terrorism of the mind that actually sustains concepts like intellectual property. You know, it's, it's a terrorism that's grounded on an idea of a brutal repression of that which is actually possible. If everything is juicy generated, it also means that you have to create something in order to be part of the society. I think one of the things that we are seeing coming out is a culture where things are produced because people care about it and not necessarily because they hope other people will buy it. So what we will see is things made by the people for themselves. I, I don't think I know a person who just listens to it and doesn't try and get involved in some way by producing or something. You know, all of these things that are taking the, the copyright industry totally by surprise and they're scrambling with and not able to deal with, you know, for the next generation is just part of the media landscape. They're natives. They're natives in that media landscape, absolutely. And they're not alone. I think of myself as a pirate. You're a pirate. <laughs> You're a pirate. I'm a pirate. I'm a pirate. I'm proud because I get my music free, so it's all right. <laughs> We're not seeing an eagerness on the part of law enforcement to start throwing teenagers in jail. I think even they have begun to appreciate that this isn't the long-term solution and that they will end up looking ridiculous. They will end up undermining their credibility. Uh, if they are perceived as the unpaid police force of Hollywood, uh, if they are perceived as taking the side of uh, clueless uh, moguls uh, who don't understand what the future looks like. I think we need to have a broad conversation that's probably going to be an international conversation where people who make things and people who use things, I'm talking about cultural works, uh, sit together and think about what kinds of... Um, uh, rules best serve uh, these interests. I don't know that we're going to agree, um, but I think we need to ask a little bit more about utopia. We need to really figure out what kind of a world we'd like to live in and then try to craft regulations to match that. Being reactive doesn't cut it. Understanding is a continuing process and it embraces many different aspects of our day-to-day -day living. It is, at root, a function which involves the flow of information the future isn't clear for sure, but 
that's why we're here. We're trying to form the future. We're trying to make it the way we want it, but obviously most people want it to be. And that's why we're doing this. Let's build a world that we're actually going to be proud of, not just a profitable world for a few very large media companies. Making money is not the point with culture or media. Uh, making something is the point with media. And I don't think that people will stop making uh, music, stop making movies, stop making, taking cool photographs, whatever. A force like this, a power like this, zillions of people connected, sharing data, sharing their work, sharing the work of others. This situation is unprecedented in, in human history. And it is a force that will not be stopped. We are not interested in compromises with, with this. We are interested in new things, not old solutions, that is, compromises. For, for quite long now, been been involved in uh, freedom of speech issues, and this is a direct uh, extension of that. So, as personal, I see the part play as a sort of organized uh, civil disobedience uh, to to simply force a change of the, the current copyright laws and the, the general copyright climate. The part play is very fun. It's a technical challenge to run it, and I really don't care much about people telling me what I can and can't do.